on international economic uh, issues. All right, something just popped in. Um, because I think that the headline here is that Japan is doing quite a bit. And that was not the, uh, um, the usual role that Japan had been playing. So I would like to then talk about why this is happening, in which areas is Japan more proactive? Uh, what are the dilemmas and the challenges that Japan faces uh, today? And you know, given that uh, Prime Minister Suga is coming to the States um, on Friday, of course, then to talk, if you want, in the Q&A more about that visit and US-Japan relations um, in the current moment. But I thought then that I would organize my remarks on three broad uh, topics. One is to talk a little bit about Japan's own trajectory over the past uh, three decades or so, because I think that if anything has become very clear to us in the past few years is that it really the domestic politics and very much shapes international behavior, the ability to project leadership, the goals pursued. So, um, you know, I think that for a long time there's been a little bit of indifference towards Japan. Uh, we've gotten used to the phrase of the last decades and assume that not much was happening. And I would like to counter um, that characterization of Japan and describe to you why it's important to consider that Japan actually is a, has been a very stable democracy that has adjusted to economic globalization. And that's a very interesting phenomena because many of Japan's peers um, are struggling on those areas. Then I would like to uh, move on to talk about where Japan really has emerged as a very important player, and that is as a champion of uh, economic connectivity, broadly understood, certainly as a champion of uh, free trade, which uh, when I was a grad student, it's not something that I could ever have said. Uh, but also in the area of infrastructure finance, a, um, the push to codify rules for the digital economy and so forth. So Japan then has uh, put together a much more robust economic statecraft and I'll go into some of the details of that. And third, and really what I'm now focusing on more in my own writing, is that I find it really interesting that just as Japan has emerged as an actor of consequence, in nurturing economic interdependence, we find ourselves in a world where the geopolitics are heating up, where uh, state rivalry is rising, where economic interdependence looks more and more like a double-edged sword. And the uh, pressure that that puts on Japan then to begin to um, um, articulate a number of economic policies that we refer to as economic security and that are much more defensive in nature and have a national security um, objective in mind. And that I think presents some very interesting uh, trade-offs from Japan's recent trajectory and then how it tackles a world where the US and China are increasingly at odds with one another in, in some very important arenas in the world economy. So uh, that's, uh, if you will, the plan, and I'll try to keep it uh, short so that um, I can hear from you, uh, uh, because that I think will make this session uh, more interesting uh, if I can uh, uh, bring you into the conversation. So my, my main argument, if you will, is that the eclipse of Japan predicted three decades ago never happened. Uh, Japan adjusted successfully to economic globalization, achieved political stability, and engaged in robust economic statecraft. In terms of using economic engagement as a tool of diplomacy, it is Japan and not the United States who is really China's peer competitor. And of course, like every other uh, government, like every other country, and in this particular juncture, Japan is facing some very difficult uh, choices. It's in a very difficult uh, position because of you know, uh, the intensification of great power competition, but also because of the tremendous shock that the pandemic uh, has been. So Japan finds itself in the worst economic crisis of the post-war period. Uh, it has to navigate uh, this difficult uh, US-China uh, uh, relationship that puts Japan in some ways in a squeeze, given that it depends on the United States for its security, but it's also very economically integrated uh, with China. And of course, this happens at a time when there has been a very significant political transition in Japan. Uh, Prime Minister Abe was Prime Minister for uh, eight years, and he stepped down last fall, and now we have a new prime minister, uh, uh, Yoshihide Suga, 
and there are questions as to whether he can consolidate and become another long lasting prime minister or whether he will actually be a short timer. And that's important again for the ability of Japan to engage in long term strategic uh, action. Uh, but I would also say that despite all of what I just said, that you know, prior dismissals of Japan have proven premature, and therefore that we shouldn't uh, assume that this uh, spells doom by any means. And I think that more and more the United States is actually depending on this um, proactive, uh, more strategic uh, Japan. Now it's true that Japan has uh, very clear shortcomings um, and they're very well known. Of course, demographic decline, which represents a, a huge problem for uh, Japan in terms of being able to sustain its economic growth and attend to the needs of its uh, aging uh, population. Then for a long time, Japan has, uh, has had a deflationary economy. Prime Minister Abe made progress in uh, stepping out of that uh, situation, but still remains uh, a fragile uh, situation. And with the pandemic, there's concerns that Japan could revert back uh, to that. And of course, we know that Japan imposes uh, restrictions on the use of its uh, military power. So Japan is certainly not in the league of a great power, uh, but Japan can do quite a lot. And in many ways, uh, I think that that partnership is becoming more and more important for the United States. And that's why what I have been doing, especially an article I wrote recently for Foreign Affairs, is to um, um, talk more about the strengths that sometimes I argue go underappreciated. And let me just very quickly walk you through those uh, strengths and then I'll uh, turn to uh, uh, Japan's economic statecraft. Uh, one is that, you know, um, given how much upheaval there's been in the domestic politics of the industrialized West with the rise of populism, with a backlash against uh, globalization, I think that Japan is no longer the laggard here. I think that Japan actually stands out by the fact that you have uh, political stability and that you have not seen this uh, rejection of economic uh, integration. Uh, globalization does not resonate uh, as a taboo word um, the way in which it does for many uh, Western uh, publics. And we're in a context where uh, you know, mature uh, liberal democracies that have adjusted to economic integration are increasingly in short supply. And I think that makes Japan uh, more important, uh, not less. Now, some have said that, well, there's no surprise here. Uh, there's no backlash because Japan has not internationalized. Japan has uh, kept globalization at bay. But I would make the case that, in fact, Japan has experienced very, very intensely two forces of globalization that provoke a lot of uh, turmoil uh, in industrialized countries, certainly uh, the United States. What I have in mind is the offshoring of production and the uh, and, uh, trade integration with China. And if you look at those two um, dynamics of globalization, Japan actually has globalized quite a bit. Just to give you some sense of what I'm talking about, uh, the foreign production ratio for Japanese manufacturing uh, these days is close to 25%. So that means that a lot of what Japanese companies produce, they're producing not in Japan, but uh, in other countries. And for some sectors like transportation equipment, the foreign production ratio is as high as 47%. And what this means is that Japan, actually Japanese companies since the late 1980s, when there was this exodus, this push uh, of foreign uh, direct investment have been among uh, the first to create this uh, regional production networks, global supply chains, the fragmentation of production where you allocate different stages of manufacturing to different countries to tap on their comparative advantage. And that produces a very specific type of uh, globalization. And Japan has been on the lead on that. Um, and Japan also trades very intensely with uh, China. China is now Japan's largest uh, trading partner. And very interestingly, you do not see the discussions that we saw, for example, in the last, uh, well, in the 2017 presidential election about the China shock, about China's imports wiping out American factory jobs. You don't see that level of um, rejection or uh, controversy when it comes to Japan's trade with China. And actually, uh, some people that have replicated the methodology of author 
um, and his colleagues for the case of Japan find that the more uh, um, in, intensely a certain prefecture trades with China, the more job creation there is. And this has to do with, again, the manner of integration that I alluded to, the fact that we're talking about uh, global supply chains. Um, now, it is also true that Japan has suffered many, many setbacks economically, certainly, um, and that this is also now um, um, eroded what had yeah. been certainly one of the, the most significant achievements of Japan, and that was the creation of the middle um, uh, class society. Income inequality has certainly rised in Japan. If you look at Gini coefficients, in Japan, they have now converged to the level of other industrialized countries. But I think it's important to point out that the drivers of that inequality seem to be different, that uh, in countries like the United States, we see a tremendous concentration of economic wealth in the 1% of the population, whereas in Japan, a lot of the income inequality is more what I would describe as bottom up and has to do with the a uh, uh, very drastic expansion of what we refer to as non-regular workers uh, who do not have the same uh, um, benefits, uh, pay, career, uh, promotion prospects. And, you know, non-regular workers, many of them female, now represent something like 38% of all uh, Japanese um, employees. And of course, of course, there is frustration in Japan with its leadership for its inability to, again, restart robust uh, growth and uh, make sure that these social cleavages do not increase. And it's certainly true that that frustration has uh, gone in the support of maverick uh, politicians. Uh, but I think it's interesting to um, make the distinction that none of these maverick uh, politicians say Koizumi, Koike, um, Hashimoto have really come out as um, uh, demagogues uh, assaulting the integrity of Japan's representative uh, democracy. So there are no attacks on the independence of the courts, on the uh, press and, and so forth. So I think that that again is a very interesting uh, trajectory uh, for Japan. And of course, by comparison with the United States, I think that Japan's poli Japan, Japanese politics look very sedate, very calm. But uh, if you want, we could also discuss in the Q&A that um, it doesn't mean that Japan does not have uh, uh, important uh, challenges to its democracy. And certainly uh, there can be something like too much stability. So we need to understand why uh, there is this apathy and indifference to uh, the political process in Japan and what that does to the dynamism of a democracy. But nevertheless, it seems that Japan is in a different place than other uh, countries in this, uh, uh, at this juncture. Now, let me uh, quickly, uh, this is something that I've done more in the past, uh, um, and that is to um, talk about the rise of Japan as a very uh, important actor in uh, promoting economic interdependence, connectivity, and negotiating um, uh, trade agreements. And again, as I said before, when I was a grad student and also a, a younger <laughs> professor, uh, you know, the words were always that Japan was defensive, that, you know, Japan had sheltered its market, that Japan used non tariff barriers to keep uh, foreign companies and foreign products at bay, and that Japan was very passive, always punching below uh, uh, its, its weight um, when it came to uh, international trade negotiations. And uh, none of that applies. And I think that, it, um, you know, Japan now uh, is at the heart of uh, some of the uh, most significant uh, trade agreements that we've seen. Uh, keep in mind that in the 2000s, uh, two decades ago, Japan really had no preferential trade agreement to speak of. Uh, it was actually, uh, the Japanese uh, government was becoming very worried because everybody else was moving in that direction, uh, but they were not able to uh, because of domestic uh, uh, divisions and constraints. And, uh, you know, in two decades, Japan now has negotiated something like 21 free trade agreements that covered close to 80% of all Japanese trade. So again, a lot has been happening in this front. And I would say that more important than that, not uh, every trade agreement is the same, is the fact that Japan now has been associated or has been the main uh, leader in, in, at least in the case of one of these or two of these uh, mega trade agreements. So we're talking about very significant multi-party trade agreements that capture something like one third or so uh, uh, 
15% or so of the world GDP, depending on which uh, mega trade agreement uh, we're talking about. And I would say uh, just briefly that uh, Japan cut its teeth in the uh, TPP, the negotiation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Trade Agreement, which um, really had been, um, the driver of that negotiation had been the United States until uh, under President Trump, the United States walked out and left an already finished uh, mega trade agreement. Um, uh, it abandoned it. And many people felt that that was the end of the uh, TBP. And I remember that I probably, uh, for my own uh, sanity, um, when, the, this, when the election happened and I knew that the United States was going to withdraw from the uh, TBP, I wrote an op-ed that said, the TPP is dead, long live the TPP, making the case that it was time for Japan to pick up um, uh, the mantle of the uh, TPP because it made a lot of sense for Japan to make sure that this project uh, did not die. So why is the, um, and, and then this led to the uh, comprehensive and progressive uh, TPP. Why was it important for Japan to step up to the plate? Well, uh, because the uh, CPTPP is a very ambitious agreement. It provides a rule book to enhance the operations of supply chains. It has, uh, it's a very comprehensive set of disciplines uh, that cover the digital economy, state-owned enterprises, competition policy, uh, in addition to very ambitious uh, liberalization uh, uh, goals in the order of 99%. Uh, here, Japan actually was uh, the country that had the lowest levels of tariff elimination and that had to do with uh, agriculture. And I'll, I'll get into that in one uh, second. Um, but it was important for Japan to protect this rule book. It was also important for Japan to uh, uh, put its own uh, uh, vision blueprint for trade integration in the region at a time where China is rising and becoming more and more influential. And I also think it's very important for Japan to rescue the TPP, to keep it alive in order uh, to wait for uh, the possibility that the United States could come back because these mega trade agreements are important economically, but they're also very important for the geopolitical significance and for the, uh, uh, the Japanese um, uh, government, uh, it has been very important for the United States to be a part of the regional economic architecture, to be a power with presence in the region. And therefore, you can imagine the huge blow it was when the United States walked away uh, from the uh, TPP. So, um, and uh, after that, uh, Japan also then finalized an agreement with the European Union. And more recently, um, there's a new mega trade agreement and Japan is part of that. And that's the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP. Uh, the largest trade agreement uh, to date was just signed uh, last fall. And we need to wait for some more ratifications before it goes into effect. But that's a very uh, important mega trade agreement because China is part of it. Uh, because again, it helps blunt this narrative that um, uh, the world is um, decoupling from China, quite the country. China is part of the largest trade grouping. And um, even though China was not the leader of the RCEP negotiations, it actually uh, benefited greatly um, because it did not have to uh, surrender its tools of industrial policy. There are no disciplines in RCEP on state-owned enterprises and subsidies. And there's, uh, of course, a provision on freedom of data flows, but there's a huge national security exemption that can be used uh, um, uh, quite easily. Uh, but nevertheless, Japan has played itself now at the center of these emerging mega trade agreements. And that's not the uh, only arena that uh, Japan has been playing a more important role when it comes to uh, the world economy and international economic governance. Another ma major line of effort uh, has been uh, infrastructure finance. And of course here, um, we know that China has uh, a very ambitious program, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. And, um, you know, sometimes I feel that that's the only thing we talk about, but that Japan actually is a very important player in this arena as well. Japan has been financing infrastructure projects around the world, but certainly in uh, Asia for decades. 
And um, you know what it did more recently is that it then uh, launched what it calls uh, the Partnership for Quality Infrastructure and announced a, a $200 billion um, uh, funds for a number of years to support this. And very importantly, uh, Japan then went and um, codified standards for high quality infrastructure investment. And the point I want to highlight here is that in many ways, Japan has found its mojo uh, when it comes to uh, rulemaking. It is doing this through trade agreements, but it also has gone out and codified standards on infrastructure uh, finance, um, uh, standards in the G7, G20, APEC. And the same is true uh, for uh, the digital economy with the initiative of freedom of data uh, we trust, where Japan uh, is trying to uh, um, uh, disseminate um, rules on what we do with this very, very important uh, and area of the economy that's only going to become uh, um, increasingly so more important. And, you know, what we were also witnessing in this uh, um, push for a more assertive or robust economic statecraft was that Japan was now prepared to offer a blueprint, a very comprehensive blueprint of uh, its vision for the uh, region. Uh, what we refer to as the free and open Indo-Pacific. And I think what's novel here is that we're talking about a whole of government uh, initiative whose uh, central concern is to, um, uh, you know, uh, increase uh, connectivity uh, and stability in the region. So, you know, it's animated by principles such as a rule of law, freedom of navigation, uh, um, uh, protection of uh, democracy, but also a very significant push on the economic activity with the pillars that I have been highlighting, trade, digital, and uh, infrastructure. So, um, you know, a lot has been happening uh, to be sure, but I think that um, we're now uh, witnessing a very important, uh, a critical juncture, I would say. We are really at a crossroads. And of course, these are uh, longer term trends um, that were, and here I'm thinking mostly about power shifts in the region, uh, the burst of new uh, technologies. Uh, but uh, these trends, I would make the case, were also uh, intensified, accelerated because of the uh, pandemic. And I think that what has been uh, really important uh, to note is that, um, and this is where I really would uh, love to hear your thoughts as I'm trying to uh, develop my own ideas here, is the way I see it is that there is increasingly a state rivalry that is shaping patterns of economic interdependence. And therefore, I think that we are transitioning to a world where there is now uh, an interdependence with sharper elbows, if I may put it that way. Um, and I think that um, Asia, it's actually uh, the, the center of this, is exhibit A of these uh, different um, um, cross currents. And therefore, uh, they're going to impact uh, Japan and of course, uh, the United States, given the central priority that we attach in our foreign policy uh, to the region. So think about these uh, uh, different uh, cross currents. And let me um, just briefly illuminate what I mean by that. Uh, as I was just telling you, um, you know, Asia has been at the center of this way, this crop of mega trade agreements that they, what they're trying to do is try to increase integration, obviously facilitate flows of trade and investment, enhance the operation of supply chains. And, uh, uh, you know, have rules that uh, uh, allow for that. Uh, but on the other hand, the region is also ground zero for uh, the US-China um, trade war uh, during the uh, Trump era, and the still very much ongoing uh, tech competition. Uh, but it's not only uh, China and the United States, uh, so I'll highlight using the uh, case of Japan, many other countries are also increasing their uh, defensive measures. And to me, this then puts Japan in an uh, in a interesting place. And it's not only Japan, but that's the country that I focus on, uh, because I feel that now Japan is facing what I refer to as a balancing act between continuing with what has been really a winning proposition, and that is to push Japan, put Japan's weight behind economic internationalism, 
with the uh, new reality that economic security uh, is uh, becoming more and more central to the way in which states interact and the way in which these patterns of trade and investment uh, takes place. And I think this is important because I would argue that the logics of economic interdependence and economic security are different. And therefore, they are really important trade-offs. What do I mean by the logics? Well, for example, if you think about economic internationalism, we're thinking about greater connectivity through international rules, whereby states agree to tie their hands. They make certain commitments uh, on trade and investment. And if you are operating a strong regime, like the trade regime has been, they also agree to third party adjudication of disputes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but I contrast that with economic security, which aims at resilience, risk reduction, and where states give themselves a lot of discretion in invoking national security controls to restrict international economic transactions, escape from international commitments, and give advantages and preferences to domestic industry. <clears throat> so I'm beginning to lose my voice, which probably means that I should not continue very long. Um, so to me, the challenge is that international economic relations are increasingly seen through a security lens and China and the United States are becoming more skeptical of economic interdependence or are trying to mold economic interdependence more and more to their advantage. That has always happened, but now I think that that's uh, becoming a more important uh, driver. <clears throat> so a word on China. Um, China emerged as a central hub of supply chains and the largest trading partner for scores of nations. But China, I would argue, has practiced selective globalization, keeping some sectors off limits and actively using industrial policy. And uh, it chose to decouple digitally from the West under the principle of internet sovereignty. China now has greater ambitions to lead on frontier technologies and has emphasized self-reliance and is more committed, I think, to this goal after the uh, pain of the uh, tariff war. But more importantly, I think that it's the tech competition that really has affected uh, China, especially the move of the US government to place Huawei and other Chinese telecom firms on the entity list uh, revealed a very critical vulnerability of China and that is that it is not yet capable of producing the most advanced semiconductors. Uh, regarding the United States and its more uh, and its growing skepticism or defensiveness towards um, economic interdependence and globalization, I would make the case that this uh, skeptical view goes beyond uh, frustration with a policy of engagement with China and is informed also by a disappointment on how the gains of trade have been distributed to different groups in society and by the broader expansion of national security concerns in the formulation of foreign economic policy. So I think that you know, there's quite a big difference in the diplomacy, in the foreign policy parameters of the Trump administration and the Biden administration. But actually there's uh, some areas of continuity and one very important area of uh, continuity where it seems that there was agreement here where the, uh, the minds met is in the notion that economic security is national security. You find that framing in the national security strategy of Trump and in the interim national security strategy of Biden. And of course, this concept can mean many different things, but I think in general, it's fair to say that it attaches greater importance to the protection of the domestic industrial base, the pursuit of technological prowess, greater um, attention to the relative gains. It doesn't matter that we all benefit from trade. What matters is who benefits more and how that can be used for uh, uh, national, increased national power. And it justifies the use of tariffs and on other defensive measures to accomplish those goals. So we see the United States, therefore, tightening the scrutiny uh, of foreign direct investment, especially if it comes from uh, China. Uh, the United States has also um, uh, stepped up in implementation on export controls and is now reviewing a far more comprehensive set of export controls that would cover emerging and foundational uh, technologies. <clears throat> 
We find that industrial policy now has bipartisan support in Congress and that there could be some uh, significant amount of money uh, allocated to this. And as I explained when I mentioned the, the uh, case of Huawei and how it was placed in the entity list, that the uh, United States is now prepared to exploit those choke, choke points, choke points in the semiconductor supply chain. So what does the, this all mean for Japan? Just very briefly, because I cannot go past five minutes uh, um, more, so I can hear from you. Um, well, I think that it's important to note that when it comes to economic security, I would say that there is uh, muscle memory in Japan. And by this, what I mean is that Japan has long been sensitive to the vulnerabilities of economic interdependence. Uh, there were uh, have been other periods when Japan has felt exposed, vulnerable, uh, because uh, subject to the vagaries of uh, the world economy and of uh, major powers um, uh, exploitation of those vulnerabilities. And I'm here, I'm thinking especially the 1970s. The 1970s were not an easy uh, decade for Japan. Uh, there were the uh, oil shocks and then there were the Nixon shocks. And I think that this led then uh, Japanese leaders, especially uh, under Prime Minister Ohira, to develop the uh, concept of comprehensive security, which had a prime focus on how to overcome Japan's economic uh, vulnerabilities. But we are in the 2020s, not in the 1970s. So even though I think that that, that is already in the, um, the economic security as a concept is well ingrained in the practice of Japanese uh, diplomacy in the uh, strategic thinking, I also think that we should uh, pay attention to the differences. Um, you know, the nature of the challenge is different because we're talking about much uh, denser links of economic integration uh, today than in the 1970s, especially that much closer integration that comes from the supply chain. Also because Japan's international role today is different than it was in the 1970s because Japan itself has emerged as a champion of trade and as an important rule maker in international economic uh, governance. And because the capacities are very different and this is something that I, I wanted to mention when I talked about Japan's new leadership role in trade. Mm -hmm. And that is that Japan now has the ability uh, uh, for uh, strategic policy formulation through centralization uh, of those uh, capabilities in the prime minister's office, the amelioration of the bureaucratic sectionalism and, and so forth. Um, and I would say that the essential geopolitical gambit is, uh, is not similar because Japan's largest security challenge today comes from its main trading uh, partner. So, um, you know, in three minutes, let me just say, that uh, Japan has recently established an economic security division in its national security secretariat, that it's currently uh, devising a new national security strategy and we expect that they'll have a lot of uh, measures on economic uh, security, uh, that this already has begun to affect some policy. Japan has tightened the scrutiny of foreign direct investment. And also in the midst of the pandemic, the Japanese government announced a program of subsidies to strengthen supply chains, and in particular to address cases of overdependence um, on uh, China. And um, I can go over the details of those policies if you're interested, but my last, last comment here is that, of course, Japan must adjust to the current environment. And I think it's important for Japan to protect um, critical technology to coordinate with like-minded partners and have convergence in economic security measures. But the risk here, and I do take this very seriously, the risk here is that Japan or other countries can overcorrect, compromising openness and innovation, robust international exchange, and the health of the supply chains that are essential to its economic prosperity. Because if economic security runs amok in the international system, this would undermine Japan's most cherished goal, the preservation of an open uh, rules-based world order. I'm sorry it took me longer than I expected, but uh, I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Silas. That was a very informative um, presentation.
Um, I wanted to offer you the option of having individuals voice their questions directly to you, or if you'd like us to moderate them through the chat. Um, I like to hear from the people themselves. If Absolutely, you of course. No, <laughs> so wait, wait, that's why I wanted to offer. You're listening to me, so I would love to hear that from them. <laughs> Um, so in that case, uh, we'll probably have individuals uh, raise their hand, use the raise hand function, which I believe you can find in the participant or the chat. Do you know which one it is for the raise hand? Yeah, um, in the participant list. And then if once you raise your hand, we'll call on you um, and you can speak to Dr. Silas directly. Yeah, and you can also turn on your cameras when um, you decide to have a question as well. Yeah, Dr. Carlo, um, I recognize you. You can voice your question you put in the chat to Dr. Solis. Thank you. Please make sure you're unmuted when you ask your question. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this, um, you know, really insightful and enlightening and I think very clear headed um, presentation. Um, you know, not. I think thinking about Japan's place in the world is, is not always that way. And I think yours was a very needed um, corrective. Um, I know you wanted to focus more on the future and um, you know the external relations of Japan. And this question is a little bit more domestically focused and somewhat backward looking. But my question was, to what extent is, is globalization more palatable politically in Japan? because it's been largely outward rather than inward uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, the immigration level is, you know, very low. Uh, inward FDI is very limited. Um, and of course, there's also the agricultural sector exception that you mentioned. So um, some of the things that, um, you know, make um, external relations and uh, globalization very problematic in, in politics and in, in developed countries in particular, uh, are not as prominent in Japan. So to what extent do you think that is a factor? And um, if so, uh, how might, how might um, greater visibility uh, of, um, for lack of a better term, greater visibility of um, geopolitical competition maybe affect the balance in terms of public sentiment towards external relations? And by visibility, I mean, you know, um, the uh, Chinese, um, ex, you know, military expansion and, and incursions into, you know, what Japan claims as its territory and so forth, um, of course, are highly visible. Uh, and so, you know, uh, could potentially possibly um, make uh, external, well, globalization problematic from a different sort of angle. So any thoughts on that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you so much. That's such a, a rich set of uh, questions and issues. And I, I like very much the way you frame it, uh, whether the visibility makes a difference to um, how the public reacts to this. And I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of truth to what you say that, um, and that's why in the talk, I try to emphasize economic globalization, because one area where Japan certainly has been lagging has to do with immigration. And that uh, has been more difficult uh, for Japan. It's not an immigration country. Um, even there, though, there have been significant changes uh, over time. And um, more and more um, foreigners now live in Japan, and especially uh, foreign workers. And they're becoming uh, ever more needed given the demographic trends that I mentioned and the uh, very uh, real uh, labor shortages that Japan faces and the specific number of industries and sectors. Um, so, you know, when I started going to Japan as a grad student, I think that um, they were not that, probably I'm dating myself too much. I'm telling you how old I am, but there were not a lot of um, foreigners around. And now I find that more and more, um, you know, the past year I haven't been able to be there, but more and more um, I, I see the presence of foreign workers in, um, in services in, um, you know, but uh, so you have at 
at the both ends of the services industry, you had the, the people in the financial industry and so forth, but you also have a lot of them in retail. And um, I think that Japan still continues struggles with the word immigration. That still would probably uh, create some um, um, uh, controversy. And I think that the government has um, opened the door to uh, immigrants, but defined as foreign workers with very limited ability for long-term uh, naturalization. But change has been happening, even though from the point of view of other countries, it would seem too little or too slow. Nevertheless, if you judge Japan's experience on its own terms, I do think that there's significant change. I also think that before the pandemic hit, there was a lot of uh, um, uh, tourism. Japan actually made tremendous progress in bringing uh, uh, a lot of tourists and they actually were very important uh, to the economy and um, I do worry about what's going to happen after the pandemic and this is not just about Japan but in general borders have been closed for so long and I think that it's going to take a while a very long while for that ability to uh, um, to travel and to uh, you know uh, do study and do other things that are very important in Japan and other countries. Now it is true that foreign direct investment as a share of GDP is uh, um, still very small compared to other industrialized countries. Um, and a very important point that really highlights the, the distinction you made between visible or not visible, actually foreign direct, financial foreign direct investment is very important to Japan. 30% of the uh, foreign investors represent 30% of the stock market. That doesn't mean that that's something that is very concrete and that you do see um, in the streets, but it does mean that there has been internationalization of the financial market, um, uh, but perhaps not of the most visible kind. To me, the real one where I do think that Japan is different and there is very concrete manifestation is with the offshoring of production, because that's the one that generates a lot of uh, strong views. And uh, here in the United States, of course, we know that offshoring is, um, is a very controversial uh, word. And in Japan, I don't want to uh, portray that there has been no debate on the country. There's a very specific term, kudoka, which means hollowing out. And it means that given how much Japanese firms were uh, transferring production abroad, that there have been concerns over time about what this does to the health of the uh, industrial base at home and what are the employment uh, implications of that. But you do not have, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, an organized social movement uh, to try to uh, go counter this. And I think that there are a number of reasons for this. This has to do with the way in which the labor market operates in Japan. You know, mass uh, uh, layoffs in Japan are extremely rare. And companies, um, you know, for the regular employees have faced very significant legal hurdles to let uh, workers go. And the country, in the situation in which Japan is today, we actually find that uh, there's labor shortages, not surpluses. So, um, and finally, I think that what really matters is that, um, you know, I think that in Japan, there is more of a sense it's an island country. And given the vulnerabilities I, re I referred to, there's a very clear sense that, and, and the fact that the internal market is going to continue to contract. I think that there's a very pragmatic uh, view that Japan needs these outward connections uh, uh, for its own economic uh, prosperity. So I think that a combination of all these things uh, uh, helps make, uh, lower the temperature on globalization. But, but I take very much uh, your point about visibility. I think that's very insightful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlisle. Um, what other questions does our audience have for Dr. Zillis? Oh, yes, Dr. Gravella. Okay, I'm saying that the host would not allow me to unmute myself for a moment for some reason. <laughs> but hi, Maria, thank you for the talk. So um, you made a lot of good points about how um, domestic and international politics are intertwined and how, you know, the domestic story in Japan has really played a role in enabling its outward leadership and shaping what that's looked like. So um, I wonder what your thoughts are on, you know, the importance of the role of the prime minister and the kinds of changes that you talked about, because 
of course, a lot of people have talked about the importance of Abe himself, but you know, more broadly, there are all the changes, um, like the administrative reforms in the 1990s and 2000s that empowered the prime minister vis-a-vis -vis other parts of the Japanese government. And so I think, you know, what people are wondering now, of course, I'm sure you get asked because I get asked all the time, is, you know, after Abe, what, um, you know, to what extent do those changes mean that Japan is more able to continue playing that kind of leadership role? Or, you know, is it really dependent on, you know, having someone at the helm who can steer it? Or do you think some of these other, you know, kind of more structural factors that have shape Japan's position will continue to sort of propel it towards, um, you know, wanting to take a more forward leaning role on trade. So how do you see, you know, that that leadership role and those reforms um, playing in? I actually had someone suggest somewhat counterintuitively that having a stronger um, sort of the power of the cabinet office and a stronger prime minister role might be bad if you had a poor prime minister, like a weak prime minister mm -hmm. and the bureaucracies were less empowered. So I think there's all kinds of thoughts about how this might you know, fit together. So what are your thoughts about that? Um, yeah, so I think that you know um, the changes over time that have empowered the office of the prime minister, administrative reforms, for example, are very, very significant because uh, Japan did not have executive leadership for the very long time. Uh, you know that different uh, uh, ministries would be battling one another and therefore Japan would not have a consolidated, a unified voice in these international negotiations. Also because of the power of you know, vested interest in particular agriculture, still very important, but does not have veto power anymore over um, trade policy. So all those changes are there and uh, um, they help Japan with that. And then of course, the creation of the National Security Secretariat, I think that Japan now has capabilities that were not there before. Now, uh, the ingredient of political leadership also matters. And I think also matters, um, you know, how strong the prime minister is in fending different factions within his party, especially when he, if he's going to be pushing vested interests because he's trying to advocate um, certain reforms, and what are the prospects that we'll have a longish term prime minister or not. So I, I would make the case that structural changes that empower the prime minister office are there, and they will continue to serve Japan well. Um, but the, the question I think is, you know, since we just had an important leadership transition, um, what are the chances that Prime Minister Suez consolidates his power and stays on for a long time to see through his initiatives? And, uh, you know, this is significant because Prime Minister Suga, I think, that has put on the table two very important reform initiatives um, that are very uh, needed. One is uh, digitalization and the other one is decarbonization of Japan. Now, these are not going to happen overnight. These are initiatives that would take a very long time. And these are reform proposals that are cross cotton So therefore, they probably would affect many ministries and very uh, important vested uh, interests. And uh, the question is, does he have sufficient political capital to push them through? Um, and, you know, he also, you know, I don't envy him. He came into office at a time of severe crisis for Japan where, you know, the pandemic continues to, um, uh, when things seem that they're getting a little bit better then the next wave hits and so forth, the decisions on the Olympics, the fact that a lot of the Japanese public is extremely worried about going through with the Olympics and that he has to face uh, uh, voters later this year, put him in a very significant uh, bind. Um, but then the question is, of course, who are the, <laughs> what are the alternatives? And, you know, the opposition party in Japan, opposition parties in Japan are still uh, weak compared to the liberal democratic party. So, um, I think it's a very important period in Japan to see Prime Minister Suga, uh, how he handles this very important phase of the pandemic, how he handles Olympics. I think the visit this Friday to the White House is important for him to consolidate and begin to build credentials as a statesman, because that has not been something that he was dealing mostly with in his prior career. Um, so I think it's both. I, I really think that political leadership matters. Political management is important. And, uh, um, you know, but on the other hand, there have been administrative and structural reforms that uh, enable Japan to do more than it had been uh, able to do in the past. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
So we have one question in the chat. Um, someone wanted to know that you used the word naturalization um, and they wanted to know what, if you could elaborate on what you meant with respect to your talk using that word. Yes, I was just uh, thinking of becoming a Japanese citizen. So, you know, permanent uh, settlement in Japan as opposed to a foreign worker program where you come for a certain number of years and then you head back. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right, we'll open the floor to more questions and we have uh, time for maybe one or two more. All right, if there are no further questions. Oh, Dr. Carla, you have another question. Great. Well, since there's an opening, I might as well jump in. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, you didn't get to the second part of my question, which was, um, you know, arguably sort of geopolitical competition is, you know, more visible uh, than the sort of globalization that, that, that the Japanese government has been directly involved in. So uh, my question was, is that likely perhaps to um, change public sentiment towards globalization in some way? Uh, if you have any thoughts on that question. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let me, um, let me, you know, give it, give it um, some of my views. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're getting at, but I feel that, um, you know, Japan, like many other countries in Asia, again, uh, who are so economically integrated with China, I'm very concerned about the deterioration in um, in uh, U.S.-China relations. I think that it's it's fair to say that these supply chains really thrived at the time where um, geopolitical risk was lower than it is today, when there was not a constant rewriting on the terms in which these transactions can take place, because that's the the uh, question with these export control measures and so forth that there or the unilateral tariffs uh, that you know the US and China imposed on one another and completely disregarded WTO process that they undermine the predictability of the rules of the game. So I think that uh, then there is a concern then of how Japan navigates uh, its relations with China in light of what is uh, stiff competition between the uh, two great powers. So. Um, how would that affect uh, Japanese sentiment is hard to tell. I think that, um, and this, you know, this has happened mostly because of the growing pressure that China is applying on, um, on Japan's, um, on the Senkaku Islands and the East China Sea. I think that public sentiment in Japan towards China is not very positive. Um, and it has to do with the perception that uh, China is not, um, is flaunting rule of law and it's becoming ever more aggressive. And I think that the recent adoption of the Coast Guard law gives reason for greater uh, uh, concern. Um, but on the other hand, I think that um, given the zigzagging of US foreign policy, you know, we went from Trump and now to Biden, as I mentioned, there's some continuity, but there's also um, very important uh, differences given the I would even go as far and say sometimes isolationist um, feelings sometimes that we can detect in this country. Um, there's concern about whether the United States will really be there. Is America back for good? I think is a question that many elites in the region are asking themselves. So it's not an easy one to navigate. I think that Japan, as we'll probably will see when Prime Minister Suha comes to, to Washington, they of course, interested in a very robust um, Alliance with the United States, there's greater convergence in many areas, but there, uh, there's some concern about how the United States is applying economic pressure and resorting to some of these measures that also have collateral damage. Japanese firms are also losing uh, markets and opportunities. On the other hand, uh, there is a desire to deter China and to uh, create pressure or incentive structure for China to play um, fair when it comes to uh, economic e exchange. So it's, it's a very difficult landscape, I think, for Japan and other uh, Asian uh, countries. Thank you. All right, I think that concludes our, se our uh, session. And if we have no further questions, I'll pass it over to Kimri. Couple in Lena.
join the meeting. Yeah, so amazingly, we are actually slightly under time. So if there's any last minute questions, we can quickly do those. Oh, I think there is one. I think Sishin. Oh, is that just clapping? Oh, no, just clapping hands. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So then thank you, Dr. Solis, for your time. We greatly appreciate your participation in our conference. We will now have a short break before panel one, societal changes across Asia, which will begin about 10, 15 a.m. Hawaiian Standard Time. So thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Solis. Thank you.